this thing on. Uh, all right, so this is uh, from the archives. This is uh, part two of Portrait of the Cyclist as a Young Man. Uh, introduction. So this post continues from my archives, the story of how I became a bike racer. Uh, what started as an unearned identity became an object lesson in recognizing self-delusion. Things improved a bit from there, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, here's how I looked at the time. You can see how hapless I am. Whoa. I've got uh, my belt is on crooked and my uh, hat is on crooked. My collar is buttoned up wrong. Just kind of a mess all around. Um, so as I was saying at the end of my last post, I took up bike racing mainly because my dad had forbidden it. So it wasn't like I was trying to rebel against him. It's that my mom kind of was. Um, she really was disgusted by his attitude because he said famously, you boys are too stupid to race bicycles. You'd get yourselves killed. So she heard that and then she insisted that we all sign up for the uh, Red Zinger Mini Classic. So I submitted my application and a few days later I brought my bike to the high wheeler in Boulder for its mandatory pre-race inspection. Look at that. Um, so it failed the inspection. The tires were shot. Uh, now that I think back, it's a little weird that my dad forbade us to bike racing, for, forbade us to race bikes because he thought it was unsafe when he was allowing us to ride all around town, up end car, down Flagstaff, all day long on bikes that were completely unsafe because the tires were completely shot. So somehow that escaped his notice. But, you know, he couldn't be bothered to maintain our fleet, and uh, he was too cheap to pay a shop to do it. So we tried to, our best to fix our own bikes so long as replacement parts weren't required, our budget being basically zero. So uh, it didn't always work out so well. So I remember one day I decided my brakes weren't working right. Probably the pads were worn out, but I was too stupid to know that. So I uh, thought, well, maybe I'll just cinch down the center bolt a little bit. And uh, so I tightened the bejesus out of the center bolt, thinking that, you know, tighter is always better, right? So I'm heading down, uh, heading down Table Mesa, heading toward King Supers, and I put on the brakes, and the, uh, the spring was crimped too tight in the calipers to... Uh, spring back so uh the brakes stayed on and my bike grounds to a halt oh thank you check it out but that's that's much later in our story uh so yeah um so i i remember dismounting the bike and um not being able to figure out what was going on and so i finally grabbed the calipers and kind of pulled them apart manually and i'm like well i can't use the brakes anymore until i <laughs> Till I have another crack at fixing them. So uh, the other problem is when my bike got a flat tire, I would sort of be in purgatory for a while because um, I didn't know how to fix it. So my brothers could fix it, but they took their sweet time in getting around to it. So uh, during one of these bikeless periods, I borrowed my brother Brian's bike probably uh, on the sly. And uh, <laughs> I remember riding down the street and I'm just shocked because the bike's just riding like boom, 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 boom. So I jump off and I, I look at it and um, he had skidded so badly on that tire at some point that he completely wore through the, the tread, wore through the casing and, uh, and destroyed the tire. So he fixed it with shoe goo. So um, no surprise, our bikes flunked the inspection. So I wish that that the tires were the only, weren't the only um, flunkable um, issue with the bike, the only safety problem, because the gears were a mess. It would have been nice if they'd condemned those. My dad had forbidden me to use the gears originally. Um, he probably thought that I'd like get distracted and drive into a parked car or something. But um, I eventually transgressed, and my brother Max taught me how to use the gears. Uh, we were riding riding down a hill once, and um, he was just totally dropping me. And so finally he was like, hey, take those two levers and just push them all the way forward. So all of a sudden they go from first gear into tenth gear, and I'm flying. And I'm like, whoa, where have these been all my life? So uh, incidentally, if you think it's odd that you would push both levers forward to get into your very highest gear, that's because you're familiar with most modern or even ancient derailers. Well, my bike uh, had the Suntour Spurt. 
So check that bad boy out. That thing worked backwards from every other front derailleur ever made. Oh my gosh. Had the wool pulled over my eyes. Okay. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so uh, by the time I had shifting kind of down pat, uh, my dad decided to give me lower gearing or something. So he swapped out the whole freewheel on my bike, swapped out the rear derailleur, probably added some links to the chain. Uh, and this was all like used stuff from some other bike. And the bike never shifted cleanly again. I could I could never get it to work right. But uh, that wasn't a safety problem, so the high wheeler didn't help me out there. Um, but, you know, as it is, just getting new tires on the, uh, the Albert boys fleet was kind of a major, uh, fiscal catastrophe for the Albert household. I mean, the way my, my dad harumphed about having to buy, you know, four pairs of new tires, you'd think that the race was asking him to buy us all EPO or something, but, uh, but he did it. Probably the economist in him couldn't handle letting the race entry fees go to waste and who knows, maybe now that he realized our bikes were unsafe, he was going to do something about it. But the whole ordeal made me look at my tires closely for the first time and uh, notice kind of how fat they were. Now, for complicated reasons, my bike had 600C wheels, which is uh, kind of like um, it's about 24 inch. And, you know, I bet this thing could be useful for COVID, right? Look at this. I could wear this while I ride. I see that angry hiker who comes up and starts sneering at me and pointing away. I could just pull that bad boy over. Or I could just wear this. That's a classic. <laughs> no pun intended. All right, pun was intended. So anyway, um, yeah, so the tires, I looked at them and discovered that, that they were kind of fat. They were uh, like one and three eighth inch wide. This bill's kind of messed up. So... And then I noticed my brothers had these really cool, you know, one and an eighth inch tires. Like those were so badass. And um, so I'm calling around, not only trying to find 600 C tires because the high wheeler didn't have them, but I'm like asking for narrow ones. And no one's happy to hear from me because apparently 600 C tires just didn't even exist. So in instead I'd get this big lecture about how, uh, you know, width doesn't matter. It's not going to make you go any faster. It's actually less stable to have a little fatter tire, blah, blah, blah. And I assumed I was being told the truth, but I didn't care because, you know, looks trumped everything. But um, it was only a matter of time as well before I realized that these guys are just full of crap and they're all lying out their asses. They wouldn't ride fat tires on their bikes. I'm sure they all had nice skinny tires. But uh, anyway, I finally found some 600C tires at a shop in Denver. They got put on my bike, it passed inspection, uh, which is kind of lucky because um, my bike didn't have reflectors, which you are also supposed to have for the race. But uh, my brothers had removed the reflectors, and in fact, they kind of worked the whole bike over for me. Uh, they took the stem-mounted shifters, and they relocated them to the down tube where they belonged, and they took off those, uh, those chicken levers or suicide levers where you could break from the tops, and uh, they actually sawed off the stubs where those things attached. Um... And this isn't because they were like just super cool uh, big brothers or anything. It's because they might end up riding with me at some point. And uh, they don't want to be seen with some guy who's obviously a rank amateur. But, you know, one of the benefits to the Mini Zinger was this bike clinic that they uh, gave for, for all the riders. A mandatory clinic, but they found some old veteran racer. I wish I could remember who it was, but... Um, so they took us on a, a ride up end car. So this is this road, so like a mile or two climb, uh, leading to the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, so we all met at the Spoke, which is a local bike shop at the Table Mesa Shopping Center. And uh, the, oh, thanks, Lindsay. The people I knew from school were there, which um, kind of ticked me off actually, because I was supposed to be the cyclist, like. Um, you know, I was the one who watched Breaking Away. I was the one who knew what the uh, the Red Zinger Bicycle Classic was. And I was that was my identity. But all these other guys suddenly are there. And to make matters worse, they're giving this kid, Mike Blaney, a hard time because he had a Schwinn. And he's trying to defend himself. He's like, yeah, but it's a nice one with quick release. So this made the other kids laugh even harder. And they're like, oh, quick release. And that kind of terrified me because uh, I'm thinking like, my bike 
has these tiny wheels, it could easily be mocked just as badly. And I didn't even have quick release. So sure enough, it wasn't long before some guy went and started making fun of my bike and its tiny wheels. And uh, the look on my face must have been downright lugubrious because uh, the guy seemed to suddenly take pity on me. So he lifts up the bike and it's like, oh, but it's so light, <laughs> which it wasn't. But, you know, just like that, the, uh, the fusillade of teasing that I expected to get never really materialized. Like everybody just kind of, um, you know, they just kind of backed off. And that actually kind of pissed me off, believe it or not, because uh, it was like they knew I couldn't handle a little verbal abuse. So I think I would have almost rather been teased. But then on the way out of the parking lot, I tipped over because I just switched to toe clips and straps instead of the mini clips I'd had, and I was still getting used to them. So I felt like a complete Fred, and we hadn't even left the uh, the parking lot yet. Um, so then things got worse from there because actually the the ride up to the base of NCAR to the to the climb proper was actually on some pretty steep climbs. So we climbed Stanford Avenue and Vassar Drive, which gains about two hundred and thirty feet. Not really a lot by modern modern uh cycling standards for me but it might as well have been Alpe d'Huez back then so I'm just huffing and puffing I was totally out of breath I was actually kind of dizzy by the time we got to the base of uh, the end car climb I thought I might even hurl so that sucked and then you know the actual climb wasn't that steep so I was able to kind of loaf and uh it didn't really matter at this point that I'd self-identified as a cyclist for years or that I'd had the first bike helmet of anyone in the uh, in the community or that I loved breaking away I was dropped immediately and mercilessly. So just like in gym class, I was dead last. Uh, so the leader of the clinic, he dropped back. He was trying to be a good guy, trying to offer me some encouragement. And he kind of suggested, well, you know, you might want to get out of the saddle and just pedal a little harder. It's okay if it kind of hurts. And I'm like, what? It just didn't make any sense. I'm like, I'm not keeping up anyway. What's the point in exerting myself beyond what it would take to keep my balance and keep the bike from actually falling over and, you know, finish the ride? But what this guy was asking me to do was to suffer, and more precisely, to inflict suffering upon myself, like, intentionally. It, it made no sense to me. So he left me alone and cruised back to the group, and as I continued picking my lone way up the, uh, up the road, I pondered his words. I had plenty of time to think, after all. So... I kind of started to understand what the old pro was saying. I mean, at some point in that ride, I finally grasped that what he was suggesting was not only not absurd, but actually kind of made sense. And he was kind of giving me nothing less than the uh, the key to training and to racing and, and to improvement. And I kind of thought, well, you know, maybe those who go fast aren't just more talented. Maybe they work harder. Maybe they work harder when they're already off the back. Maybe they work harder all the time just to keep improving. So you may wonder, did I take the guy's advice? Did I uh, throw it in the big ring and start hammering and catch back onto the group? No, this is not an ABC after school special. This was my life and I was a loser. Um, I understood the guy's point, but I did not have the drive to actually um, apply myself to his lesson. It'd be weeks or months or years before I, I fully um, had the psychological gumption to really embrace this ethos and to flog myself, you know, learn to flog myself vigorously and often and actually have an eye on improving eventually over time. So it's possible today to, uh, for someone to mistake me for somebody with some talent. There are actually people out there who think I have physical athletic talent and it's an illusion. Um, it's taken decades of suffering to get to where I can, go hard enough and fast enough to look like I might actually be good at this. And it all kind of stems from that day. And, you know, not to be a uh, model or anything, but that guy actually gave me one of the most important lessons uh, of my life. Um, I kind of wish I remembered his name because um, he deserves to know that despite all appearances, um, he kind of got through to me uh, that day. By the way, this is a map of the Grizzly Peak Century in case anyone's Wondering what this totally cool bandana is all about. So, uh, so the Red Zinger Mini Classic itself, that was a couple, uh, it was a week or two later, and that was a real eye opener um, for the whole family. So, watching my brother's race uh, was pretty wild for me because, you know, in gym class, they were just as big a losers as I was, you know, dead last in all the track and field events, and, uh, you know, just kind of hopeless. And uh, there's. There's Brian racing the mini zinger. Looks pretty tough. 
and uh, there's Jeff. He's going so fast that you know the cameras of the day, the shutter speed was was uh, too long to actually get that in focus. That's how fast that dude was going. But uh, they they ended up doing pretty well, especially Jeff. I think Jeff was like top ten uh, or so in the uh, in the Red Zinger Mini Classic. And I think the difference was the duration of the race. Like a typical Red Zinger Mini Classic stage lasted maybe twenty five minutes, which is kind of an eternity compared to track and field events where they're like you know. 10 seconds long and you know my family is just not real fast twitch crew like we don't have a single fast twitch muscle fiber among us um the only hope we have is to wear down our opponents and uh that's actually possible in a bike race now our brother max had missed results so he'd been a really good swimmer very talented swimmer and his bike race has always started pretty strong too he'd go straight to the front of the pack if it was a criterium he'd like lead the first few laps he'd be flying high he's like the boss of the peloton right for several stunning minutes. And then inexplicably, he would suffer some sort of a uh, mechanical problem. Like his derailleur would get stuck between gears or his chain would fall off. And he'd tend to announce the problem really loudly uh, as he came through one of these criteriums. And in one race, uh, he came around a corner and uh, somehow <laughs> his saddle had come clean off. So he's like waving it at us. <laughs> as we lowered our heads in shame. But uh, there's Max hauling ass on his uh, his Univega with its uh, Colnago stickers. Uh, so that brings us to my, import, uh, my performance. God, what a travesty. Um, I was just as bad at bike racing as I was at everything else. Probably worse. If I'd been a Japanese kid, I'd been honor bound to commit seppuku on the spot to save my family from disgrace. Uh, so the first event was a short prologue time trial, and when I saw the results, I mean, I'm looking for my name, looking for my name, it's almost at the bottom. I was so far down, I, was, I think I was second to last. In fact, I know I was second to last, because last place would have carried some distinction. That would have been like, you know, the Lantern Rouge at least. But um, worse than that, while I was hanging around after the race, I noticed some kid with uh, really, really skinny legs, and probably to try to cheer myself up or something. I was like, hey, Jeff, look at that kid's skinny legs <laughs> and jeff points out to me dude your legs are even skinnier and i looked down and to my horror i realized uh my brother was right i just never noticed my legs before i never really looked so it was kind of two rude awakenings in, in one day uh pretty tough to handle so uh the next race was the north boulder park criterium and um that was just a disaster I um, I got lapped. I might have gotten lapped more than once, even though it was a pretty long lap. I mean, it was just it was it was just abysmal. Uh, here, here I am. At least I'm out of the saddle, but you can see I'm I'm, I'm pretty damn unhappy. <laughs> um, my Leisure Time Products teammate John Lynch was like top ten, which just I'm, I was happy for him, but um kind of rubbed it in even how much worse I did. I think I was second to last again. I was uh, I was beaten out in the Lantern Rouge uh, once again to, uh, you remember the kid David M. Um, I think he was always dead last. And I probably could have tried to let him beat me so I could at least have Lantern Rouge for, for one event. But I never even knew what was going on in the race. I mean, it was just, I never knew who was behind me. I had a pretty good idea who was ahead of me, which was like pretty much everybody, but I didn't know how far ahead. Uh, it was I was just confused, lost, uh, especially after I got lapped. Then it was just a nightmare. I, I would um, I remember my brothers. I don't, I don't want to say cheering; they were watching uh, in, in horror. So I'd roll past them, snail like, and they'd be yelling at me. And it wasn't really cheering. It was more like the wailing lament you might see at a funeral, you know, where like some bereaved mother is throwing herself across the casket, lashing out at her son's having been cut down in his prime, you know. Uh, but unlike the brief moment of cheering we'd do watching like a Coors Classic stage, uh, this interaction with my brothers would go on for a long time because I was going so slowly. And they'd yell for me to shift up. So I'd put my bike in the highest gear. And then I can't even turn the pedals. And they'd be like, no, no, that's too high. Shift down. Or I'd shift down to the lowest gear. I'd be spinning like this, you know, and um, futilely. I was as awkward as the word futilely. 
actually. Um, now, don't get me wrong. My, my screwed up derailleur and freewheel can't be blamed completely on their own. I mean, I know that I possessed the ability to make that bike shift properly, but facing just the humiliation of the race and the extra pressure for my brothers, just in the moment, you know, I, um, I was just too flustered to, to even function. I mean, it was just, it was just kind of a nightmare. There I am. And after one particular race, um, I broke down crying. Uh, the, and the race organizer, Eddie Sandvold, he was a real, real kind man. He comes running over. He's like, did you crash? What are you? I sobbed that I didn't crash. I just lost. And <laughs> he didn't know what to say. His look kind of was like, what did you expect? You know. So uh, this brought about another epiphany. It was pretty stupid for me to expect any other result. I mean, I'd never done well in anything athletic before. Why should I have assumed that my knowledge of bicycles, the fact that I knew that Dave had an orange 73 Mozzie with full campy and breaking away, or that I knew about cool cycling caps, and why would that make me a successful racer? And like, what about training? Had I ever actually tried that? <laughs> but, you know, solving that fundamental problem would have to wait. Because uh, in the short term, I had to face the crushing knowledge that, you know, my dad had seen me completely get lapped and humiliated and removed from the course by the race officials because <laughs> you see I didn't understand that all the riders finished on the same lap including the lapped riders so I figured when they finished I had at least a lap or two to go so I'm just staying out there on the course knowing I got to get that three points for finishing you know which is slightly better than nothing right but by the time somebody was able to make me understand that, no, I was really done and that I need to get off the course now, uh, I was more humiliated than, than ever. I mean, it was just like baseball and football. I didn't even understand the rules. I think that's what finally brought me to tears. But um, on the drive home with my dad, he asked me, well, what did you have for lunch? I'm like, I don't know, I had some bread and cheese. And he explained to me, well, you know, cheese is a dairy product and that takes a long time to digest and it's likely that I didn't have enough fully digested food in my system to properly fuel me. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, there, uh, now out of relief, I, I, can, I have an explanation. I can tell people what happened. So I kind of trotted out that excuse several times that day to explain to my brothers and to my friends what happened and why I'd done so badly. And I was able to uh, ignore my brother's reaction. I mean, after all, they were always trying to undermine me. Of course, they weren't going to give me the you know, they weren't going to let me off the hook. But my friends, you know, after after like the second or third friend kind of looked at me like, I kind of knowing look like, yeah, right. And I kind of recognized that for what it was. It was a look that said, yeah, right, whatever, dude. And so my dad had, had kind of inadvertently taught me a valuable lesson about making excuses at a pretty young age, but I didn't do anything to improve my morale because, you know, I was a loser after all. So this is going to be continued. Uh, tune in next time for the unlikely uh, story of how I persevered in the sport, made a fresh start with a new bike, learned how to train, and went on to not get a trophy and endure an entirely new form of uh, humiliation. So uh, stay tuned, and you are going to see more of this uh more of this guy in about a month's time when I roll out the uh, the next shocking episode of the Portrait of the Cyclist as a Young Man. Thanks for tuning in.